If she had only been ugly. Welcome to Don Marrero live from the Lab Factory. Uh, we are picking up the pieces of having John Katz on here. Great guest. It was oh, he's unbelievable. He's a, he's brilliant. He's a genius. He's a, he's cute. Good kisser. Oh yeah. And uh, you know it doesn't go right for it. He he dances around so. it. It's Frazier Smith, my buddy, my um, uh, my uh, um, one of my first people buddy. I met in L.A. And it's good to see you. You too. Frazier has been uh, has a, a very eclectic career of radio star. Stand-up comedian, actor, and friend to all. Praise, I'm going to say one thing. It's amazing how all the young comics love you so much. Isn't that cool? Yeah, because I do like that. Well, uh, I mean, you come in in a suit, and these guys are in like the hoodies, and they all, they all dig you. I had a hoodie put on my suit. <laughs> a hoodie suit? Yeah, it's a new thing. But you know, your style, you, you really know how to craft jokes. Like, I can't do that, but I love those jokes. Well, uh, thanks, buddy. Uh, you know, I've always liked the, uh, the one-liner guys. That was always yeah. my, my favorite guys were always like Rodney, who you were good friends with, yeah. and uh, Carson and, and Hope and all the one-liner guys. I always loved them. So like today's comedians. Yeah, the new guys. Who do you like from today? You know, I like this kid, Rick Ingram. Do you know Rick Ingram? Yeah, yeah I he's think funny. he's great. Uh, this kid, Fahim Anwar. I don't know if you've seen him. Uh, the kid that was on last night here, uh, Andrew Santino. Oh, yeah, I know funny. who he is. He's funny. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but a lot of those kids are good. Matt Edgar. Um, what about Jay Leno? Uh, never heard of him. Oh. Yeah. Do you ever laugh at Jay Leno, or have you ever heard anybody go, did you hear what Jay Leno said? No. I was on the floor. <laughs> I've never heard that. <laughs> <laughs> I never heard that, Tom. <laughs> <laughs> but I do like Jay Leno. Do you? Yeah, he's a one-liner guy. Yeah. But I like him better as a stand-up than hosting The Tonight Show. I thought he was so great as the guest on Letterman. He was great on Letterman, right? Who would have thought he would suck as bad, so badly? Well, you know, on a, now, what is that? Is that somebody... This isn't going out, is it? No. Okay. Is that changing your style for the job? It's selling your comedy soul. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, he has a right to do whatever he wants. I'm busting his chops. He obviously is well accomplished. He was a well respected comedian. I think it, you hope well, that somebody has some integrity besides wanting to be the host of the Tonight Show or make money, but apparently he didn't. Well, you know, uh, <laughs> I'm digging myself even further down in what's left of my Don't career. Don't worry about uh, it. He, he, he's got a great sense of humor. I'll tell you what, though, he is a great stand up. I just don't like the Tonight Show that much right now. But I, uh, you oh know. God, I'll take Fallon any day. Fallon, oh yeah, Ferguson or or Jimmy Kimmel over Letterman or or Carson. I'm with you on that. Now you there. just did Fallon. Yeah, uh, was it fun? A lot of fun. Yeah, it, Jimmy's talented. Yeah, he's, he is. he's there now. He's not like some dinosaur. And I'm look, you know, I, I, it's not that I'm so young. It's just that I I can't believe. It, you know, these guys are doing the same shtick. Like, do you ever change it up a little? Throw a curve? You know, it's like, Jimmy's like fresh and, and he's yeah. goofy. Yeah, and, and yeah. I like the tone of the show. I learned what a hashtag was from watching that show. Oh, really? I had no idea. Well, but, Fer Ferguson's fun, too. Because I like Ferguson, too. Well, you know yeah. what I like about him? Uh, he, you don't, you, they give you the, uh, the, the, ask the questions, the produce, segment producers, they want they want all the questions you're gonna ask, they we want him to ask you. Right. Could you please stop with the bag? I think it's good though, it's sound effects. God. We need sound effects. Do you on this realize show. that we're we're doing a podcast? Yeah, yeah. I mean are you rather, you know, it's it's some kind of response, even though it's a bag. <laughs> well, I, you know that he's, yeah. he's looking for something. I think that's, that's important. Sure. So you guys, you guys you know who's good as Dimitri Martin? Yeah. Oh Dimitri Martin's great, yeah. First of all, you, you, nobody asked you. <laughs> <laughs> I like him though. Fraser Smith is now the guest. You're you're done. You're over. He's still better from the audience than I am he, up here. John, he was always better off stage. He's good. John, Jonathan was the best car comic. If we could only drive his car on the stage, if we could, he would have killed. If we could charge a two drink minimum to a car, <laughs> we would be rolling. I, you too, Jonathan. Good to see you. They've seen enough of this interview. Thank you Goodbye, you guys. Nice to meet you. Bye. Good to see you. I'll see you guys. All right. Um, Look how cute they are. The oh, they are. are. 
They're they're, they're going to get laid tonight. You can tell. I think they're going to get a deal too while they're out here. Slow down. Hey, Still tough guy. Hey, 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 hey. Where's the fire? <laughs> Bill, good to see you, buddy. See you. Bye, guys. Thanks, bye, bye. Take care. Take care. Love, you, Love you, John. Yeah. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, uh, you know what I like was the last time you were on Ferguson's show because uh, you guys just riff when you go on there. Yeah, yeah. That was fun. What were you talking about? Somebody, he was, you were doing, he did something wrong in your intro. Oh, my intro. So you busted him on it. Yeah, he said uh, Dom's going to be at the uh, Denver Comedy Works next week. And I go up and go, what, it's a real crack staff you got here, Craig. I was on last week. <laughs> but it's good that you did that. I said, because I'm so big now, I'm so hot that they have to post plug my date so there'll be riots. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's, he's uh, fun to watch, and I like Kimmel, too. Kimmel's great. And Kimmel's pretty good. Yeah, he's excellent. Yeah, yeah. And you see these guys improving, improving, you know. But, I mean, it's a tough thing, and, and I, I, I say that about Letterman and Leno. That's just my taste. I mean, I'm tired of them, but I think that they, they, you got to give them credit, too, for... Oh, for lasting that long. To, Come know. on, that's a long time to last on a show like that. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they're both good at what they do. Oh, I just yeah. think we've seen that for so long. You know, it's nice to see something fresh. Well, David looks tired. He looks bored with it. He does. And he, he's probably the best of all. I mean, that guy's really Leno talented. Leno looks desperate. Desperate to not get thrown off the air and replaced by Fallon. Something like that. You know? Yeah, something's going on there. Um, now, you, when you, go, you were mentioning to me last night that when you go on these shows, you've done stand up at a high level for so many years that you actually enjoy going on the show and doing a set. A lot of guys get real nervous. You weren't that nervous. Yeah, no, I wasn't nervous, but uh, it's a real challenge to me, that kind of writing, because I, to write five minutes is really difficult. You know, like yeah. five minutes, you know how, I mean, you and I do stand up almost every week together when, when we're in town, and you know how hard it is to get new material. But to organize it, like yeah, when you're, when you're up here, you could say something and then do something else that has no, no, nothing to do with it. But then you got to make like some kind of a set. Yeah, you know? yeah. You know, I tried to put together a set for TV, which I've never done recently. And, you know, it's four and a half minutes or whatever, yeah. five. And I found that really tough because yeah. you're pulling from this part of your act and over here and then over here to get the five minutes. And then it doesn't always have the flow that you would right. have in your normal set. And then you start worrying about whether you say the words right, as if it's Shakespeare, as yeah, if right, the audience right, knows. Right. They don't. Like they don't know. Yeah. Right. If you, yeah, if you say something out of order, they never know. But in your not. head, you're like, oh, I, oh, I messed that up. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, now, when you're writing, uh, do you write every day, pretty much? You're standing. Nah, up? I wish. I try. Yeah. But I get distracted by you know. ESPN, everything, or, <laughs> like, everything, food, <laughs> right, a yeah. lesbian video. Well, that'll always do it. You like yeah. watching two girls, Fresh? Oh yeah, man. All right, Come on, you just checking. Me? Come on. What's wrong with who us? doesn't? No, I think that's a good thing. If you didn't, I'd be worried. Their mothers, their mothers well, don't like watching. They might like it too. No, I don't know. know. Maybe right. not. <laughs> <laughs> that's my daughter underneath, <laughs> underneath Bertha. <laughs> Look at her ass. Look at her. Leg. Look, she she goes right back and forth from the ass. Can we get a slow mo? On that? Let's go. Let's take that again, Charlie. Yeah, that was my old joke about. I go. I used to be dating a porn star. Uh, I go. That was kind of scary. During sex, she was like, "Cut! Let's try that again." <laughs> Come on, we're running out of daylight. Let's go. Come on, guys. Guys, knock it off. Get them up. Come on. You know the one thing I am. Did you ever proud see of, a porno being shot? By the way, not live. No, no. I did. Did you? The Riviera, Sharippa, Steve Sharippa, and you know, great actor, Sopranos. Yeah, yeah, my yeah. buddy. He yeah. was booking the Riviera at the time. Yeah, it's his, his family's downstairs. It's New Year's Eve, right? Something like that. Or New Year, New Year's around that time. Yeah, holiday time. And he says, "You want to see them doing a porn? I can't go up there. My family's here." Right? I said, "I'd love to." So I go up, and the one girl is laying in the tub, and the other girl's pissing on her. And I'm thinking, I wonder, I guess I should have seen the beginning. <laughs> yeah, I, think, I came in too, I came in halfway. How did it you get You never to want this to come point? in halfway on a golden shower. No, how did it get to this point? That's What were you going to ask me? You were gonna, uh, I can't I inter- remember now. I'm thinking about golden you. showers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> you totally distracted me. Uh, no, I think I think guess what I was saying is uh, when you when you do a TV set, uh, it's just it's just harder than it looks to put it together. It's much harder. Yeah, yeah. especially you know, see, I would think that you would have less trouble because you have real jokes. You you know, know? The hard part I find is memorizing because you know people always ask me. Yeah, you have but a you lot do a, you do a set whenever you have you're a lot hosting. of jokes. They go, you got a lot of jokes, so how do you memorize them all? 
Well, it's pretty easy because you put them in an order, right? And then you have a flow and you change them every once in a while. But when you're doing the TV thing, like I say, you're pulling from all over your set. So you're going, what was next? Yeah. I found myself doing that when I was trying to make my demo right. to send in, you know? Yeah. I mean, Fraze is, uh, he's not only an excellent stand-up, but he's like the best host we have. When he, he always ties his show together more. And he knows just amount, the right amount of, of time to do knows when to, like, it, and, it, and the thing about it is, we don't, like, go, oh, the MC, like, uh, Americans, some think that, to me, it's like, in a lot, in a lot of countries in Canada and Ireland and England, it's the star of the show that's the MC. He's the host. He, the show I think I should move around. to Britain. Uh, you know, <laughs> I might make some money. Yeah, well. <laughs> no, but I know what you mean. A lot of times, the host in those countries is, like, the star of the show and puts the show together. Um, uh, you know, I enjoy hosting, Dom, because that's what I want to do. I want to get a hosting job. Ho well, hopefully you should someday. be. I mean, without yeah. a doubt. I don't want to do that to you like it's done to me. How come you're not doing that? Like, you Ugh. don't want to. But, I mean, it's funny. I was thinking of your relationship with Jamie. And Jamie Masada, the... Uh, By the way, I love the way he's your sidekick. Sometimes was, my sidekick, sometimes not. Well, it's, uh, you know, uh, he was my sidekick for years on the radio. And I still don't know what the hell he was talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. Well, I'm still trying to figure it out. It's amazing that just you, if you could assimilate more of the Frace, language. Frace, you know, we'd be in the middle of a bit. And we, we would have like a skit. We were going to do a, a spoof of a... I remember we were doing a, a scar phrase. And it was, a, you know, we were doing movie spoofs. So he was playing phony Montana. <laughs> so we were about halfway through the script, which he was butchering. And then at one point he just stops and goes, Love Factory! <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Wait a minute. The hell did that mean? <laughs> no, he just, just he would always in. try to put that into oh, every yeah. skit that he was doing. Well, have you ever seen a guy that gets more publicity out of bad things than, you know, like when Phyllis Dillard died? Out of anything. He goes, "You got to come down here, buddy. Talk about Phyllis Dillard." I said, "I really didn't know her." You, yeah, but he, she was on your show. Like anything to get the Laugh Factory logo. I just want the, the logo. Oh yeah. my God! Everything, all the Michael Richards thing. Michael Richards thing, as horrible as it was, it put uh, it on the map. Oh, it put him worldwide. And Phrase, can you tell the audience, the, I never referred to the audience, just, uh, I want to hear about the Michael Richards night, because were you the host that night? I was the host, and uh, really so an run exciting, us through it, will you? exciting night. Uh, you know, just seemed like a regular night. You know, we're doing the show, and uh, the crowd was a little rowdy that night, but, you know, regular show. And then Suley McCullough who had gone on first, and I were upstairs watching the, the big screen and talking. And, and then Michael Richards was on. I just brought him up. And all of a sudden, he starts getting into it with the guys right up here. Uh -huh. It was right up there. And they had a birthday party. And what was happening was the door guy had let them in. They paid him some money to let him in, even though they were really supposed to be here for the late show. So they were up there, and the... And, oh. and the uh, so they weren't even, like, paying attention to the show they yet. They weren't paying attention. It was like a birthday party. Because Kramer was, wasn't a big deal to them. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think that was it. And, you know, they were being loud. But most comics know how to handle that a little better than he did. <laughs> well, I guess so. I hope. Uh, I anyway, would think there's yeah. another way. But uh, he starts going off and dropping the end bomb And Suli and I are looking at each other like, did that just happen? It seemed yeah, like yeah. almost a surreal... Uh, moment in time uh -huh. and so we came running downstairs and, and I'm in the back there and Sinbad had just walked in I hadn't seen Sinbad since you know the 40s or yeah. something <laughs> and he goes phrase is this what happens here at this club oh, it's a rough club <laughs> yeah I go no dude I, I go, don't think I'm gonna bring my mom and dad here <laughs> yeah, I go I don't know what that was that we just saw so we're all standing in the back and the one guy that he gotten into the beef with goes I want everyone out of this club now you know the guy yeah. Like he's so everyone got up and left. Wow. And, and the entire crowd is, is bailing out. And Michael Richards was lucky. He ran off stage. And if he'd gotten caught on the stairwell with everybody coming down, they'd, who they'd, knows? They would have torn him apart. So yeah. he somehow just made that window. Did he go out that door? No, he went up to Jamie's office, up, oh, way upstairs. Oh, and hid. So he was hiding. And uh, somebody goes, well, you got to go back up there. I'm like, what? They go, <laughs> <laughs> you know, and they go you're the host. So I had to come back up here, and Jim Gaffigan was on next, who's probably the whitest God, human know. being yeah, yeah. in the planet. <laughs> oh, no. the, 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 I, he probably hasn't been in here since. No, I haven't seen him back here. Or Sinbad. So anyway, I, I said, uh, I'm bringing you up. And he goes, oh, no, you're not. Uh, he goes, do some time, man. So I, oh, no, you're not. <laughs> yeah. So I'm up here just, and there's nobody left. There's like 12 people left in this section over here. 
And uh, so I, I, you know, I did the best I could. My opening, my line, I go, uh, sorry about that, folks. <laughs> And I think I remember seeing that. And that got on every news clip. I mean, it, you know, it was on the end. Sorry of the, about that, folks. <laughs> that's all I got to say. So, that's you know, great. Uh, after all these years in comedy, that's all I had. Well, I don't, it's kind you of shocking. You don't know what to say. And then I did say, I go, I think we just saw uh, Kramer morph into Mel Gibson. That oh, got a laugh. Funny, yeah. Because it was just after the Mel Gibson thing. So anyway, I, um, you know, I, I said that, and I do my little shtick, and then I brought up Marino. And Mike Marino's good with that kind of situation. He, he gets up and he goes, hey, I'm from Jersey. That happens all the time in Jersey. Oh, did he? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Nothing to it. You know, so he yeah. took over and he, got the, he did a good job that night. And then... I didn't know there was more show after that. We, we finished the show to the 12 people who were left. And I've never seen Jamie more upset, by the way. Not because of what happened, but because he had to give people their money back. <laughs> that, <laughs> that put him in a bad mood. Oh, that mood. hurts. Yeah. So uh, anyway, so I, you know, the weekend comes, and, and uh, this happened on a, a Friday night. And I'm up at uh, another club on, on the weekend, and somebody said, hey, you know, I bet somebody's got a videotape of that. And videotaping was just starting to happen on phones back uh -huh. then. Way, not everybody was doing it. And I, th I right. thought, you know what? Maybe what year was it? Do you remember? Well, Katie think, was still working here, so... I'm thinking, what, 07, maybe? Oh, okay. Something like that. Anyway, um, uh, so there was, of course, a videotape, and it, and it came out, like, a, on Sunday night. So I'm sleeping, and I'm getting all these phone calls at home, just ringing off the hook at, like, 4 in the morning. <coughs> and it was all my East Coast friends who'd right. seen the clip oh, yeah, and were yeah. calling to say that they saw me on the clip. Okay. So they're calling like crazy, and I'm going, what, what's going on? Who, what is this? It turns out everybody saw it around in the world. So they were all calling me, and then CNN and everybody called, and they wanted me to go on. Yeah. And I didn't want to do it, Don, because I didn't. I'm always a hog for publicity, too, like all of us, I guess. But I didn't want to go on and, and you know, pile on the guy. Everybody knew what he did was wrong. Yeah. And you couldn't really be on his side, so you'd really have to kind of go on and bash yeah. him. And, you know, so I just didn't do any of that. Um, Interesting phenomenon, huh? How... Uh, the way you say something is so much more important than what the, what you say, yeah. Because you know, as, as we, you, Fraser and I know, we have thirty year old, thirty ish black guys who call us their nigger, out, out of love, yeah. and then we have you know guys that are in their fifties that would never say that word, and we would never say it in front of them because they went through civil rights and yeah. and it's very delicate with them. So it's so much in the meaning more than the word. Yeah, that is know? true. Uh, but he went. He, 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 I heard he went off on Jews at the improv well, he like had a done, month before. Yeah, he had done stuff like this a lot. I, I saw um, him storm off stage here uh, not long before he was that. He so jealous of the young comics who were so much better than him. Well, he couldn't take it because he couldn't compete with Kramer. Here's the other thing that's weird. Yeah, and that's what it was. Because this girl had yelled out, uh, we love you, Kramer. And he went ballistic. He threw the mic down. He goes, that's not my name. I'm not Kramer. Oh God! It's a character. Fuck you! And walked Did off he the really? stage. Yeah, and, and it's a character that made him a billion dollars. Well, yeah, he is know? Kramer. He is. Yeah. that's the best thing he ever did. It's and the she only didn't thing mean here. any harm either. If if you know, okay, you don't want to be known. Of course, we love you, your... Kramer. Yeah, we, we... I mean, so uh, yeah, he had some issues, and um, but it's funny how an, an incident like that, um, you know, I got a million calls. And I started to get sick of telling my side of that story. Right, sure. So I get this call. I'd gone in to pitch a TV show to some pretty big people. And they had a show on the air. And uh, they weren't returning my calls after the pitch. They said, oh, we love your pitch. And then they didn't return the calls. So I couldn't get them on the phone, couldn't get them on the phone. So I'm driving around like a day or two after that. And their assistant calls me. Hey, they really need to talk to you. They, they need to talk to you immediately today. And I'm thinking, wow, man, they're interested yeah, yeah. in my show. They're interested in your story. Yeah, I can't wait to, yeah. So I call them, I, I, I get them on the line, and the first thing they go is, what was it really like with Kramer? And I go, what the fuck do you think it was like? And I hung up on really? it. Really? Yeah, and these guys are big producers. Oh, jeez. But by then, I was sick of answering the questions. I never you know? saw that side of you. Well, you know, I mean, it's just, it's just that that thing got so... Uh, I guess the word would be viral these days, yeah, that yeah. it got to be uh, kind of uh, toxic in my mind. Isn't it a shame that the most exposure you ever got was... Something horrible. <laughs> Something horrible, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Doesn't surprise me, but yes. You know. Wow. Yeah, because yeah, I got a call from Katie, I think, one of the waitresses, 
And I think she was waiting on those people. Right. And she said to me, they were loud, but they weren't really talking to him. They were just ordering drinks. But you know what happens that's weird that, that you know, it's just uh, kids met or whatever is, um, uh, you know, that night, remember Brian, our big security guy, the super big guy that looked like Wild Bill Hickok? Was he white or mixed? A white guy who was Oh, huge. yes, I do remember him. The Man Mountain. Yeah, right. I was thinking of the other guy who was mulatto, who was, had, uh, or, he, looked, he was an offensive lineman for the Rams. Yeah, yeah, him? yeah, that guy. That the was big Joey red. Pesci got fired. That was Joe Pesci. That's another great story. Yeah. But this guy, uh, you remember him. He was gigantic. Yeah, I do remember him. So he was like always stationed upstairs. That was kind of his thing on Friday night. And oh, this was a Friday night? Yeah, it was a Friday. Oh, so there was a pretty decent crowd. There was a good crowd, packed crowd. And uh, so Brian had said to me just before this incident, he goes, I'm go I think I'm going home. I've got the flu. I don't feel well. Mm -hmm. So I'm out of here tonight. So, I mean, he left like 15 minutes before this happened. Oh, so there had was no Brian security? Been here, had Brian been here, that never would have happened. Right, because he would have quieted them. Yeah. And so... How long did it take for Michael to blow up? He's probably on for maybe, you know, five minutes. You know, uh, uh. and they were being loud. But what Brian would have said was, hey, why don't you go back behind the glass right. there and have you your party be as loud as you want. Yeah. And, uh, you know, that would have been taken care of. So everything has it's life is weird, isn't it? I mean, yeah. And, and it was a matter of time with him, though. I mean, yeah. not that it was going to be that big, but there was definitely something brewing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was having those incident, incidents pretty regularly. And I remember he got into an argument with Stephen Baldwin here on one of James uh, Davis's shows. Stephen was in the... Oh, really? Yeah, and he had said something. Uh, he would bash uh, Christianity a lot. And, and Stephen's a Christian, and he didn't appreciate it. And he said, hey, man, you know, he stood right up in the middle of the show. What are you doing? Uh -huh. You know, and, and, and said, uh, you know, something to the effect of, you're going to be in trouble. I don't want to be standing around you because you're going to get hit by a lightning bolt, you know, or something one of these days for talking oh, like yeah, that. And that was karma. like, yeah, and that was like, uh, you know, a week before this happened. So, well, um, I just wanted to get, uh, know something about your life, and I'm, I'm, I'm completely changing directions, but I don't know. Like, you're from Detroit? From Detroit. Just run yeah. us through some, some of your highlights of your life, because I don't know where you went to college, where you went to high school, where you, well, you, know, how I, you started stand up, how you started radio. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm from the Detroit area, and uh, lucky to have gotten out, Dom. So, you know, I, I went to Western Michigan because I couldn't get into Michigan. And at least it had the word Michigan in it. Yeah, yeah. You just blank out on the envelope. Just put something, put something <laughs> over the, the w, w. And you look like you're having it. Um, so I'm there. And Tim Allen was going there. I knew Tim Allen. Oh, yeah. In college. And yeah. he was selling drugs then? Used to buy weed from him. Did you really? Oh, yeah. Isn't that funny? Yeah. He, he ended up being like this multimillionaire. Yeah, he's a, yeah. Always a cool guy, though. And, yeah. uh, you know, so Western was cool. And uh, I took communications, and there was a guy there named Tom Pagel who uh, Tim is credited with uh, sort of helping him get started too because he was a guy who'd worked at ABC television for years. So now he was teaching, but he had a real knowledge of the business. You know, here he is in Kalamazoo, Michigan, but here's a guy who'd you know, been on a high level as a director for ABC for many years. So he ran a really good TV uh, course there at Western. So I kind of got into that, and then I wanted to get into radio, and I got a, a job at uh, the, the campus station and then I wanted to make money at it, so I got a job at the local Top 40 station in Kalamazoo. And I always tell people that that's the best way to get started in radio is to go to a small town, yeah, of course. a small station, because you wind up doing everything, Dom. I had to do, I literally turned on the transmitter, swept the place wow. out, did the sports, did the news. What was the pay? Minimal. I forget what it was, but it wasn't much. And but it, in college, I didn't care. I yeah. thought I was in the big time. That's pretty cool. Yeah. And, and you know what it does? It teaches you everything. I knew how to do sports. I knew. And what you'd have to do is, though, as soon as you put a record on, you'd have to run over to the, you know, they had the AP uh, wire thing, tick, 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 tick in the, you know, in the uh -huh. other room. And you go there and you write down your sports scores, you know, and then run back in and do the sports. And then you'd have to run back in and get Reminds the news. Reminds me of the SCTV skit. Remember when, uh, I think it was Rick Moranis would run downstairs and do like one line from like a Michael McDonald song? Yeah. Or Christopher, Christopher, whatever that. Guess? Uh, no. Not Christopher Guess. Believe it or not, I'm walking on air. Da, 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 da. Oh, I know. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chris, Christopher Cross. Chris Cross, yeah. yeah. But uh, anyway, just remind he'd be running down and 
doing everything yeah, like that. Yeah, that, they, they've done skits like that before about it, and, and uh, it's really true. You're a one-man show, and I think that's great because it teaches you everything. You know, you know how to do a little bit of everything. So that was my big uh, break there. Then I, um, when I graduated, went to De back to Detroit and got on the radio there. And uh, in doing the radio there, I, I had to do a lot of personal appearances. So it was, it's kind of like stand-up a personal appearance because you have to talk to the crowd and give stuff out. And then, uh, you know, that was fun. I thought, oh, this is cool. I, you know, I'll try stand-up. So they didn't really have any clubs back then. So I went, there's a place, a blues club in Ann Arbor uh, called the, uh, the Blind Pig. So I went down there and I was like, you know, they put you up before the blues guys. And you do some stand up and I had no idea what I was doing. And you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, but that got me started in that. And then uh, when I moved out here, um, I had thought I, was, I had a show lined up with the guys from Firesign Theater. I was a big fan of Firesign Theater. That's nothing but a brown paper bag. Ragnar Kassin. <laughs> yeah, I, Would you like to sit in the waiting room or wait in the sitting room? <laughs> Mr. Danger. Good afternoon, Mr. Danger. Do you know what this is? <laughs> yeah, so it's a brown paper bag. That's correct. Look inside. What do you see? A pickle. A pickle. That's nothing but a cheap ring from my cracker back jocks. <laughs> I'll sell it to you for $5,000. What kind of a job do you take me for? First class. First class. <laughs> Love those guys, right? So, and then I was friends with them a little bit because uh, they had come out to uh, uh, and done a show out in Detroit and I hung out with them. We opened, I opened for them in, Detro in Detroit. Oh, that's cool. So that was cool. So they said, hey man, uh, come on, you're pretty good. Why don't you come out to the coast? So I came out, thought I had a job with them. We didn't really connect on that and then finally I did connect with one of the guys on K-Rock we got a comedy show on Sunday night at K-Rock uh -huh. and what, what year was this this was 78 oh wow really? 78 jeez and this thing blew up it was called Hollywood Night Shift and we would just riff we would put on uh, you would have loved this show we'd put on sound effect records that would go from anything from a pneumatic drill to a you know a car chase to whatever <laughs> you know, and, it, and we had this thing called train ride to hell and we'd have a train and we'd be on the train and every different layer we would be ad-libbing about where we were and uh, bullshit so it, it caught on the fun. show the show caught on and um, and it got pretty big and then they gave me a spin-off show so all of a sudden I'm doing a Friday and Saturday night show and it's rare in, in were you doing any stand-up at all uh, no, you didn't I, have time. I, I didn't really have time, and I didn't know what where to go. Actually, there weren't there was only comedy store it, at that point, and it was hard to get into. There was no improv. Oh, excuse me, improv was here too. Yeah, they were both hard to get into, and um, they're so still hard to get into. They, they are. I still haven't gotten in. In her thirty years, <laughs> is that true? No, I've been. Oh, you're at the comedy no, store. No, yeah, yeah. But I, um, you can see Frazier at the comedy store every Sunday night. Don't say that here. Cause I'm saying it. I'll never get on the stage again. I'm trying. Listen, buddy, John, why on the Dom show did you play comedy store, buddy? <laughs> I can hear it now. So anyway, uh, you know, I, I uh, was doing the, uh, and, and this thing went through the roof. For some reason, my show went through the roof. I think it was because I could play whatever I wanted musically, right. which is very rare. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, and, and I, I'm not an expert on all kind of, uh, music, really, but I, I know what I like, and I played a lot of stuff from different areas. I play a soul tune. I play James Brown. Then I play the Ow! Sex Pistols. Then I uh -huh. play, you know, uh, you know, a classic rock. And, and, and so I was, I was... And I broke a lot of bands. You know, I, I helped break Van Halen. Really? I helped break a lot of bands. Yeah, because wow. back then you could give a DJ like me who had free play your test pressing. And that's what used to happen. David Lee Roth. What? Yeah, you could give them, if you didn't have an album out, you could give them a test pressing or something. I never heard that term. And you could play it. You could play, well, it was... It was Is that like one song? Yeah, or it's like a demo. Right. And... Um, I remember David Lee Roth used to climb up the fire escape at uh, K Rock, climb in the window, kick my door in, and go, "Hey, dude, play my record! Come on, man!" And I'd, I'd be like, "Get the, get the fuck Climbed out of up, here!" Climbed up? Was he Spider Man? I think he thought he was. I go, "Get the fuck out!" He's wearing the spandex anyway. Was he really? Yeah. Oh, and yeah, I, and, yeah, I, and uh, so then he'd go, "You'll be sorry, dude." Are you I'm serious? I'm gonna be huge, man. So oh. I, yeah, okay, okay. They were like a local Pasadena band. Uh -huh. So one night I played it just to get them off my back, and the phones lit up like you can't believe. What was the song? Ain't talking about love from the first album. I don't know it. Great song. How's it go? Ain't talking about love. You know it's rotten to the core. 
You heard that one? A little bit. Yeah, I th- little, Ain't little talking about love, just like I told you before. It's, you know, a great song. People went crazy, and... Uh, Hold one second, Trace. I want you to have to... It's part of our train ride to hell. <laughs> uh, the, uh, but yeah, you know, I did the... Uh, uh, so then, uh, that show went through the roof that I had. And I know that I, I, I know before I got here, I had heard about you. It got really big, and I don't, I don't know what it was, maybe just the timing, but I um, remember going to a party, and Johnny Carson was there, and he said to somebody, I hear Fraser Smith is here. Wow. Yeah. I mean, my name got really big. So uh, I uh, didn't, I wasn't doing any stand-up, but Vic Dunlop, you know, uh, yeah. our good friend, was... Uh, producing stuff and he I offered, actually didn't know Vic very well. You didn't know Vic? No, because he was here before me and by the time I got to the comedy ah. store, he was gone. Well, he, so he was a friend of yours, huh? He was a friend of mine, a really talented guy. I knew and, he was very funny. I, he, I mean, I saw him on television. Or, yeah, he was on those all those shows of that era, you know, Make Me Laugh and all those shows. Right, right. And he was producing stuff too. So he says to me, hey, I got a writer for your radio show. So he introduces me to this kid and this kid turned out to be a great writer. He was like, so prolific, he, he just Woody went, Allen. Yes, he was. He was very didactic. This kid, pedantic and pedantic, didactic. and he was. I, I couldn't believe I was doing radio, but I, but he. So I had a, I had this kid, and he was great. And so I said, uh, Vic, that guy was great. And he goes, I got someone else for you. So he brings in Jamie Masada, and Jamie Masada oh, wow. was Jamie uh, is you know Jamie the owner here at the my life, co-host the who World sometimes Fans. shows up he either talks too much or he doesn't show right, up at show all. up you can't win no if we could have it down the middle it would be great but anyway he um, so I thought who is this obnoxious guy he comes barreling in you know into the meeting yes buddy I'm telling you <laughs> he, he have long long he, hair he then? has long hair and he has hat and a white suit oh god and he was on the Steve Martin show at the time really Steve Martin had a show and Jamie was on the show what did he do he was playing a Mexican are you serious yeah. You want to hear something funny? What? First of all, he's an Iranian Jew through Israeli to come here. We know his background. Right. The Iranian Jewish guy moved to Israel, moved here. Uh, one of the comments that we get uh, you know, on, on uh, Twitter are, hey, Dom, really love you, man, but you got to lose a little Mexican. <laughs> <laughs> so it comes full circle. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's probably why he got the part. But anyway, he, he, so I go... I don't know what to think about this guy. He, he was wild. And, you know, so I put him on the show as his character, Buddy Buddy. And he was just kind of this nefarious foreign dude. Uh-huh. And uh, he would butcher all the English. And then I would just sit there and, like you do when he's your co-host. I go, what are you talking about? And he'd yeah. be like, Frase, I hear about it word of mouse. Word of mouse. <laughs> yeah. I go, what? What? You and constipate he, relationship with Eleanor? <laughs> yeah. Buddy, let me tell you, I'm between a rock and a fireplace. <laughs> I must tell you. And so, you know, he was on the show. Mr. And then Malaprop. Every two seconds, he would plug the laugh factory, which is why he was doing it. So, it, it, you know, I thought, oh, how annoying. And then it caught on. Everybody loved him. Uh-huh. You know, uh, all of a sudden, who's this buddy guy? And I think wow, they thought... Wow, isn't that funny? Yeah, and they thought it, it was an big. actor. They thought it was some actor doing the voice. Right, they didn't know it was, it was really him. Really Jamie. But exaggerated, but him. Yeah, and, and, and he was great on the show, and it turned out to be a great counterpoint, because I could always just go, what? what? Shut up, you know. Uh, you know and, and everyone loved you kind of putting down, in that era, it was the era of the hostages and everything, so you're kind of putting down a... a, a you know, a foreigner, and I think people thought that was cool. Uh, I just enjoyed the rapport because right. the guy was uh, it turned out to be a great guy, and we had a lot of fun. And but he would annoy my boss to no end because the, my boss would be like, "What is that guy saying?" First of all, <laughs> and then second of all, he keeps plugging his club. He goes, right. All right, we "This got, club was only half the size." It was half right. the size, and it was it looked like a Turkish prison. It was like a little <laughs> shithole, yeah. and, you know. But I, it was Isn't there a Chinese restaurant here or something? That was where this is. Was the Chinese restaurant this, this, Fox, this room, which was a famous Chinese restaurant. Really? You know? Yeah, and the stars used to come up nonstop and, and get takeout. No kidding. Yeah, it wasn't much inside, but the was Greenblatt's here. The yeah, food that was really good, and Greenblatt's was still here. And Jamie had the little place at the end, and it held maybe you know seventy people. Mm. So uh, Jamie goes, "Well, if you plug my club, you can play at my club." So I would come down here and I'd plug the hell out of the club because every time I was coming down here, I'd say, hey, I'm going to be down there. So, um, you know, we loved playing this little club and that's where I started doing stand-up, and, really. And um, 
Love that club. Was and the stage always here? No, the stage was over where the oh, bar is. Oh, that's right. Now. Okay. Stage where the bar is. I do is. remember, I think, seeing that this Paul Mooney was here a lot. Yeah, Mooney was here a lot. And, and was Mooney, Pryor really the first actor? Is Jamie bullshit? No, that's bullshit. Uh, yeah. Although Pryor did come down here. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, Jamie. Cause, I love the way he just lies to practice uh, lying. Oh, he's, he's keep gotten, in shape for what he he's needs. He's gotten very lie. good. Pathological. Yes, yeah, he's gotten to be very good at it. But, you know, Pryor did play here. Richard and, Pryor, first guy on stage here. Roddy no. Dangerfield's last set was on this stage. Probably really was. Probably that, that. probably was true. And. You know, I take that back. Maybe Pryor did do his last, or his, was the first one on this stage. Maybe. I don't know. But the other stage over there, no. Oh. And, but, but Mooney would bring him down here. And then Mooney would also bring Eddie Murphy down here once in a while. Uh, I, I came in one day, because and, and they had an afternoon show or something. And I came in, and there was Mooney on stage. And then he brings up Eddie Murphy. So Eddie Murphy's in this room where Eddie he was Murphy at, was at already the, a star. Yeah, at the height of his career. Oh, okay. He just done Beverly Hills Cop, or, you know, and and, and uh -huh. uh, he's on stage at the Laugh Factory in front of like seventy people. Uh -huh. So he does his set, and they're leaving, and um, and Mike Tyson was with them, <laughs> and Tyson had just won the heavyweight championship. He was uh -huh. like twenty-two, and so they're out front. They're getting ready to leave. No one is recognizing Mike Tyson. Everyone's surrounding uh, Eddie, trying to get an autograph. So I go, hey guys, it's the champ, just to give him some pub, you know. And so uh -huh. everyone left Eddie Murphy and ran over and, and tried to get a picture with him. Uh -huh. So then Tyson couldn't leave. He goes, hey, why did you do that? Now I'm uh, stuck here. You now, know, so, you know, now, he's, now you got Mike Tyson pissed at me. Now he's pissed at me, right? Yeah. I'm like, I. Hey. So, um, you know, we took auto, uh, photos with Tyson and everything. And uh, that, it was always uh, exciting, that little club, but you never knew what was going to, it would come into the, uh, become this. Yeah. And I got Tyson's story real quick for us. I'm at the improv and I know he's in the audience. Right. So I go on and I, I stop and I go, you know, I just want to say, I, I, was, I was watching a, t a thing about Mike Tyson. What a great guy he is. What a terrific, what a great fighter. He's, he's devastating as a fighter, but, he, but he's intelligent. He's really got a lot going for him. And then I go back into my act, right? And I'm yeah. totally fucking pandering, knowing he's in the audience. Right. And he comes up to me and goes, Hey, that was really nice of you to say that, man. Thank you. You know, did, did you know I was here? I, thought, I had no idea. I, I always talk about you. you know? <laughs> I, I had a Tyson an ass kisser. Yeah, yeah, right. Well, when it's Tyson, you know. Well, I was at the Arsenio show, and uh, and Daly Pike was the warm up guy. So okay. Daly's saying to me, I'm talking to Daly, and he goes, uh, "Hey, you do a great pre uh, impression of Tyson. Do your Tyson impression." I'm one of the greatest fighters would ever fought another fighter. I'm a great boxer and a brawler. The <laughs> other guys are just dinosaurs. You know, so I'm doing this, yeah, yeah. and all of a sudden I feel something really, like, thick poking me in the back. I turn around, it's Tyson. He's poking me with his thumb. I, I just oh, about oh, shit. Oh, oh. I was like, what? Did he bother him? No, he goes, he pretended to be pissed. Why are we doing that? Why I don't understand why you wouldn't be making fun of me. And I'm like, I, I was just, I, you know, I was backpedaling and he goes, I'm just kidding. That was pretty funny. You know, he was cool. Oh, man. Yeah, scared he was the hell out of me. Bad motherfucker. Yeah, man. Especially back then. Oh. That was when he was really dangerous. So, you know, we had fun here. And, and I remember one night, um, another story was that we were doing a charity. And I had plugged the charity, and this is, this is what showed me my ratings were starting to drop. No one showed up. Really? Yeah, you know, it was no one. Show Usually, I would fill places. What do you like think that. happened? How do you, how could it fall off the cliff? I like think that? what happened was we were just plugging too much stuff. Every week they we got had, tired of hearing. Yeah, they wanted twenty more, things. More I'm, content. Yeah, yeah, especially at Laugh Factory because I was always plugging something. Right. At Laugh well, Jamie's Factory. relentless. I know. So we would. Yeah. So we had this food drive, and and so this, there was one couple that had shown up. There, there was a bunch of comics and one couple, and the couple was from the Midwest, and they had somehow heard about it. So they're sitting in there looking like they made the entertainment mistake of their life. <laughs> and uh, we're all out up front, ready to cancel the show. All of a sudden, this limo pulls up to go to here at, uh, next door at the uh, Chinese. Chinese place, and it's Sammy Davis Jr. So Sammy goes, hey, hey man. man. <laughs> yeah, he gets down there, hey, Jamie, and he knew Jamie. Did he? <laughs> yeah, he goes, hey, Jamie, I've always wanted to do this, babe. So he goes, walks in, he's in his suit, uh, his limo driver's in here getting the food, and Sammy walks on stage, this couple from the Midwest is like, what? And Sammy <laughs> Davis Jr. <laughs> so he, gets, he tells this dirty joke that last, you know, took like 10 minutes to oh, tell. One of those. And he goes, always wanted to do that, babe. 
Have a good night. Got off stage, walked out, jumped in the limo, took off. Oh, I thought you were going to say he sang. No, no, but he, he told a joke. That's what he uh, wanted to do. Were you at the comedy store the night Stevie Wonder sang? No. Uh, Tommy Davidson was hosting a show. Right. I, and he said to me, hey, Dom, stick around. We'll get Stevie Wonder to sing. Stevie Wonder was part of this, this charity group. And I'm thinking, fuck, Stevie Wonder's going to sing at the store. And... Uh, Tommy does all that, you know, like the band and all that yeah, shit yeah. With, the, with the mic. And he, and he brings Stevie on stage to just say hello. He goes, you know, you want to sing something? He goes, no, nah, man, I don't want to sing thing. And then he goaded him into it and he started playing and he starts singing reggae women, reggae woman. The fu- you know, like they say, a standing ovation. It was a leaping ovation. Wow. It was so beautiful. It's so cool to hear that voice in that little room. Wow. You know. In the, in the OR? No, the the, the main bigger, room, but yeah. that's a little room for him. Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. yeah, wow, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. Well, you and I are both fans of uh, music and singing, and uh, uh, I think we probably would have wanted to be singers if we could. <laughs> Definitely, <laughs> right? Yeah, I've always thought that. I wanted to be a uh, basketball player, a which fireman. you were. Fireman, <laughs> you were a, <laughs> a uh, chief. I still want to do that. But, uh, you know, you, you were a, a college basketball player, right? I played junior college. Did but, you? I mean, I was, you yeah. know, I, like a, people ask me if I was good. I go, I was good for a comedian. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? If you make Jayco, that's pretty good, right? I mean, you know. Well, it's so funny because they always talk about, like, how hard work it is and, you know, how much her work. How, like a friend of mine, her mom's black and her dad's white. And she said, do you think that it's because black guys work harder or do you think it's because it's natural talent? I said, I think it's a combination. But there, there's no way you can achieve that without the natural gifts. So you this know, guy so, dribbles off his knee. Somebody says to me, you know, do you, like, because they work hard. I go, of course they work hard, but they're gifted. Yeah. You know, like I said, there's a little stubby guy selling oranges on the corner. He could never make the NBA. He could practice all day. He could yeah. get the best coaching. Yeah. You know, and, it's, and you know that about comedy or anything or yeah. singing. You know, you could take all the singing lessons in the world. My nephew is a terrific guitar player. He was he was finger picking Blackbird in a month when he started playing. I had friends that can't do that now. They play for years. Yeah, yeah. They're still playing A G. Yes. So you got to have a gift, you and then you got to work at it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, you know, uh, you and I are fans of that stuff, and I think uh, a lot of comics would have liked to have been able to sing. It's harder than it looks, though. You know, you did some singing with the band up here recently. Yeah. Uh, yeah well, how was what was that like? That was cool. It was uh, well. This you know the guy was thirty years old. He knew all he knew all the song from the sixties. Right. You know, so it was very easy. He knew all the. He heard that I knew all the Beatles songs, and uh, he so he goes, well, "What's it about this one?" We start singing, and we're we're trying to sing like the ones with the really hard harmonies, like "Babies in Black" and stuff like that. Yeah. And then uh, he said, "Well, uh, it was so funny. I had a million Beatles songs. He picked the one that I was going to pick." Wow. You know, he goes, well, what about if we do I've Just Seen a Face? I go, yeah, I was just thinking that. And I really wow. was. And then we came up, and it was, it was interesting because you forget how talented these fucking guys are. And he said to me, why don't you sing into the mic, and I'll back you up. I go, no, I'm not a real singer. I just like it. You sing into the mic. He said, trust me. You know why he said that? His voice was so strong uh-huh. that you still, it still drowned me out with the mic so if he had sang in the mic you never heard me forget it yeah, yeah. so yeah. he was just being nice oh that's awesome yeah you forget that uh, these guys have done it for years and it's really a skill yeah and, and you know um everyone you talk to uh not everyone you talk but a lot of people you talk to in show business were inspired by the beatles excuse me yeah go ahead sorry go ahead man you think that i would be as the probably more important i'll try to keep, re- keep this thing going so guys um how are we doing today? Mike Clark. Is it Mike Clark? Yeah. Mike Clark, Lenny Clark's brother. Oh, is that right? Yeah. You might have to take that. I can't take it. I'm doing okay. a show. Okay. <laughs> How is Lenny Clark? You saw, I love Lenny Clark. Me too. I haven't seen him in a while. Why can't I power it off? You're like me. We don't know how to work anything. Who doesn't know how to turn their phone off? I don't. I have that same issue. I'm too dumb for a smartphone. It says, sorry, try again to turn it off. Yeah, come on. <laughs> it's bad when the phone is criticizing you. For not you try it again, you, you idiot. Yeah. Um, what I was trying to say was, I, you know, I had an interview on my podcast recently with the um, uh, guys from Fireside Theater, and they were saying what inspired them to get into comedy was the Beatles. 
they were huge Beatle fans. Really? Yeah. I mean, I think what what they meant was that it, it just it, from our era, they were it. And what it did was it it, it made you feel like, wow, I want to be in in that business. Yeah. You know, uh, there's something exciting about that business. Well, the, the you know they're obviously the biggest act ever. Yeah. Which yeah. is you know, and, and I I gotta say for. It's very difficult today to achieve. There's Mike again. I like your <laughs> ringtone, though. That's medieval. Yeah. I am driving. I will call you later. All right. You want to text him back? No, I don't want to do anything. I'm just <laughs> turn the fucking thing off. Does anybody know how to turn this off? I don't think there's anyone here. <laughs> We're stuck. No, I'm talking about the, uh, the audience. Oh, yeah, they are. Oh, yeah. But, friends, I'm so glad to have you on the show, man. Man, I'm having fun. It's always great talking to you. Because uh, I was always a fan of yours before I got to know you. Because I would watch the uh, Rodney specials. Oh, God. Because Rodney was like my hero. Uh, still is, you know. And you, know. you got to be good friends with him. I mean, no one was greater to me than Rodney. I did it. Good. All right, bro. <laughs> You shouldn't break it? No. <laughs> I think I did. Uh, um, I know you loved him. I, oh. I loved him personally, and I, yeah. loved, I loved his act. The greatest, man. Uh, and I would watch his... What I liked was w uh, at his memorial, all the big comics, including yourself, got up and said, Jim Carrey and, and, and Roseanne and, and you and, and everybody, Tim Allen, all, everyone got up and said how he had helped them by putting them on that uh, Young Comedian special, the specials yeah. that he had. You know, he seemed to be unintimidated by uh, new talent. He he did, he was not threatened at all. Yeah. He was like Johnny Carson in that sense. Yeah. And uh, it was interesting. Our generation was what he what appealed to him. I guess the guys yeah. from his group, some of them must not have treated him well. Yeah. Because he had no time for them. Yeah. He wanted to hang out with us, you know. And uh, I remember like Adam Sandler and. Uh, I think maybe David Spade. I'm trying to think of the guys who carried the casket. And I said to Adam, he's, Adam's such a fucking great guy. Adam's a great guy. And he yeah. goes, uh, such, you know, talented, humble. I, I love the guy. And he yeah, goes, he's totally uh, cool. I said, Adam, are you speaking? Because I was on the pl plane. I'll tell you that in a second. But uh, he says, no, man, you, you, you guys will do a better job than me. You speak. I'm thinking, do a better job than you. You know, he, uh, he's a movie star. You uh, know? Yeah. But uh, listen to this phrase. This is amazing. The day of Rodney's funeral, I never see anybody on flights. Right. This was talk about kismet or karma or whatever. Louis Anderson is on my flight from Denver. We're both sitting in first class next to each other, helping each other write the, the oh. speech. Wow. But how amazing is that? Yeah. I never see anybody. Not only is he on the <laughs> flight, he's next to me. And you're going to the same we're going thing. To the same, we're going back. And to you're helping to each other write your yeah, stuff. Yeah. yeah, that's awesome. That is God at work. Yeah, yeah that's pretty awesome. Well, I, my Rodney story is um, I got to know him a little bit because he would come in on Fridays. Uh, back then I was hosting the 8 o'clock show here on Friday. And Rodney used to come in and do 15 minutes for about a year and a half, two years. Yeah, I remember. Remember? And, and so he got to know me a little bit. He was like, hey, Ray, is that right? I like those jokes. You know, every once in <laughs> yeah, a while. Would he, like your, he would like your comment. Yeah, every once in a while he gave me a tag. He'd be like, hey, try this, kid, all right. So, uh, I, but I was worried about him a little bit because he was moving really slow. He was probably 80 something, 80 maybe. And he would come in and he'd be in his shorts with his sandals on and his, half the time his fly was down with his shirt sticking out of it. And he'd wander up to the stage and he, you know, took him like, forever to get up here the crowd would give him a standing o before he started yeah that's pretty cool which i loved they were all young kids and they'd give him a standing o. yeah and then he you know he was he was always great but um just kind of slow moving slow and and no energy and yeah a man his age i was like okay he's 80 that's what he's doing he you know but let me tell you let me tell you so i i thought oh you know when i heard that he was doing a big show there was a big show and he was getting paid 50 grand I heard to do uh, mm. 45 minutes. Yeah. And I thought, wow, he's never going to make it. He can't make it through 15 minutes. Right. And he looks like he can hardly stand up for 15 minutes. So we get to this gig. I was with Jamie, and, 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 and uh, Jamie was helping Rodney that night. Where was he at? It was, at, it was downtown. I think it was a radio convention, and they had hired him to be the, ta the, the show that night. So I thought, wow, this, I don't know. This isn't going to go good. Yeah. And he shows up. He looked immaculate with the blue suit and the red tie. And he got up on stage, Dom, and he hammered 
for yeah. 45 minutes. I've never seen anything like it. Amazing. Blew the room away. Blew me away. I was like, what? Yeah. I go, where did that come from? Yeah. And it just showed me when the money's on the line, yeah. an old pro comes through. I know. I saw Carlin the last time I saw him at the Comedy and Magic Club. And I went back to give him a hug before the show. He was like a little old man. Comes out on stage, just fucking energy, charisma, yeah. humor, yeah. bitterness, fucking everything. Funny. And he, he just looked like a different thing. Yeah. A different entity. Yeah. Go backstage after to say goodbye. Now he's the old man again. Uh. Thank you so much for coming. You know, he's like, well, I'm making him an old Jewish guy. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all become old Jews eventually. Yes, eventually, yeah. Uh, but I, that's what it is. There's something about the stage, it's that, the energy, yeah. and the energy, and it brought them back. And 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 the old pros, uh, you got to give them a lot of props. I was just blown away by Rodney that night. Yeah, yeah. That I've seen him in action. I've seen him when he was. Wow, it was it was scary, Dom. Yeah. I mean, it was like a whole different human being, like you're saying. And not only that, people couldn't stop laughing. I, like, I couldn't stop laughing. I like the story of uh, with the Caddyshack thing when he thought he was having it, thought he was terrible. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Nobody was laughing. Yeah. And somebody had to tell him they're not allowed to laugh, Rodney. It's a movie. <laughs> the camp, the crew can't go. Ah, oh, that was a good one. Oh, funny. I remember, you know, I, remember I had uh, Chevy Chase was uh, my guest on my uh, radio show around that time. That and was he, he. He was cool. I know some people have had issues with Chevy, but I he was cool he was, to me. Wasn't he great in Caddyshack? I loved him in <laughs> that era. I just saw Fletch. One, oh, he's he was funny. genius in Fletch. He was one. funny in Vacation. He, he was genius, and and you know uh, he he was real cool to me. But I said, well, what was it like working with Rodney? Because he had, they had just wrapped the movie, and he goes, well, phrase he said, Rodney's great. He said, but he didn't understand that you have to read. You have to do different takes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and he would say, "Hey, how come we got to do it again?" Well, that happened. I, I know <laughs> that happened in the last movie that I did with him. Last movie, like I did some, like I did the the road movie. <laughs> right. I did. Uh, it's called the Fourth Tenor. I remember that. And we're doing a scene, which, by the way, I they wrote the part Irera. I didn't get it. I didn't get the part what? Irera. Yeah, really? somebody wow. else, a guy, wow. a guy who's a better actor than me got it. That's showbiz. I know, but uh, Rodney goes. He did the same thing. He says Harry Basil was the director. He goes. The guy goes, let's take it again. He goes, Harry, what do we got to take it again for? What the fuck? He, turn, <laughs> he turns to me and he goes, how many times we got to take it? I go, Rodney. You have to take it again because it's a movie. I said, you can't shoot a movie to real time. You can't just do one take. Yeah. If, if we did, the whole shoot would last an hour and a half. <laughs> That's why it's a month. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. He didn't but he get was. That. You get impatient because you you get some so much immediate gratification from doing stand. up Well, that's the thing about stand up, right? You get that immediate thing, and yeah, yeah. When you're asked to slow it down and do it over and over, you lose. You feel as a stand up like you're losing something. Yeah. But that's the thing, and Chevy said he also <coughs> couldn't understand why they had to move the cameras and shoot it from a different angle. Right. Well, how come they're over there now? <laughs> well, because... Well, I, I, did, I did this movie, Raging Bull, uh, Raging Bull 2, which, thank God, they changed the name oh, to the yeah. Bronx Bomber or something. Okay, because, yeah, that's a tough act to follow. But I did my scene, which lasted, like, you know, I mean, a few minutes, and then the rest of the whole night, all I was doing was the cues off stage. I thought, fuck, I'm out of here. What a great movie. Boom. I'm gone, yeah. Yeah. And I had to like do the voice to the actors on you know, reacting to me. And yeah. That took like hours. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? That's the thing about movies. When you get used to stand up, it's tough. I mean, radio, uh, it's amazing when you think how you're filling four hours. Yeah. You know? I mean, yeah. that's, that's a, lot a lot. A lot of people don't realize how hard that is. Oh, yeah. And also, the other th it's the same with a headliner in stand-up to me like you're a you're an a-list headliner and and you guys can go into any town in the country or in the world and do uh your set you're the entertainment for the night because you can do 45 minutes or an hour and people don't know how hard that is i've been well, doing this for a long time i can't get past 30 minutes you know it's it's my style's a little different because the one-liners but i in general i have a lot of respect for headliners yeah and it's the same thing with these radio talk show hosts. I was always a rock and roll radio guy, so I could do a couple of jokes and then play a record. That, yeah, you these could guys that. that can talk for yeah. four hours are amazing to me. Yeah, you can't in the middle of uh, your stand-up go here. Let me go to a joke on the video. Hey, <laughs> yeah. Here, here I am. 
<laughs> Let me play a clip. You know, but the uh, the other thing is uh, the sports talk guys amaze me, Don, because you and I love sports and we know a lot about sports. You know, but those sports talk guys I know, know more than you, though. Well, I'm sure you probably do. But uh, th- these guys know more than they should. Yeah. I mean, it's like, is that all you do? Because know. they know every player on every team. I'm embarrassed sometimes how much I know that I watch first take. And he's fucking stupid Skip Bayless and the other guy, I forget. Oh, his, some of those uh, guys are. Well, they they argue know. about stuff and Tim Tebow and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They and get I'm on. watching it. I'm thinking, this is my life. This is what I do. Yeah. You know? Oh, no, I know. You get stuck on it and, and you're like, wait a minute, enough on that. And they, all, they have to go with whatever the story is. Like they spent forever talking about Tebow before this season started and he's barely played. Well, that's the thing that's so weird about, you know, the, how the press can drive something. This, the Eagles played the Cowboys. I don't know when this is going to come on, but it was like last week. They're both three and five teams. It was the marquee game of the day. Right. Two, three, and five. Teams. Right. Uh, because they're from markets that are big football markets and big markets in general. Yeah. Seattle never gets uh, press, and they're they're excellent. They're way better than the Eagles. And uh, the the Falcons were undefeated until they don't they, get much. They don't get much. Yeah. But you know you, you hear about the Jets who suck. And they, you know, talking for some about reason more, they're copy, I guess, because yeah, of the coach the, and Tebow. The, and, yeah, the yeah. Jets get more publicity than the Giants, who have been who are much better S- Super Bowl champs two yeah. out of the last three years. Yeah, I say there's going to be a stop put to this. We've got to stop it now. <laughs> uh, the the other thing that I thought was really, uh, you know, now there's a hockey strike, right? So the hockey guys are they're all millionaires now, and uh, you know I love hockey, but these guys are on strike. Well, the guys from the past, like Gordy Howe, who was probably yeah. the best player ever, never came close to making a million dollars. No, and they're taking a big chance because hockey is not that secure in the United yeah, States. it's they're, not. They're, and they just got back their fan base and everything, and now they're fucking up again. Bad time to strike. Yeah, yeah. very bad. Now, speaking of strikes, were you around for that comedian strike that happened? No, I wasn't even a comedian yet. You weren't when that, that happened? That was like in the late 70s, right? Yeah, yeah. No, matter of fact, I was in an improv group in New York, and they said, and they knew I was becoming a comedian, and they said, "Look at this," and I read the article about the guy jumping off the Hyatt to yeah. try and hit the comedy store, and I, I go, "Wow, stand up, it's pretty rough business." <laughs> That's a tough. Uh, yeah, I don't I, know about this. I think I thought that too, man. That yeah. Um, so you were doing improv. No wonder your improv skills are so good on stage. Well, that's I, I, improv is. Do you use some of those same? Yeah, yeah. Things? That's what makes you like. That's what helped me. Everybody has their own path, you know. And my thing was, my acting experience and my improv experience gave me stage presence. So by the time I got on stage, I already had. I was comfortable. I just didn't have an act, you know. Yeah. I mean, that's an, an act, and I couldn't believe people had to repeat themselves so much to hone material. And then I realized that you have to. It's like uh, crafting a play or something. I mean, you hopefully it's a little more extemporaneous than that, but I didn't get that at first. Like, how the fuck can they say the same jokes every night? You know? Well, it's always weird to have uh, people who are not in show business come back and see you a second or third time and then realize that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I ran into some uh, young Russian kids here the other night, and they were cool kids. And, um, yeah, we love you, man. We want to come back and... You know, they right. come back two nights later, they hear the same jokes, and they're like, they don't love you as much. Yeah. <laughs> you know, afterwards. I've, I've had people stay. I had a chick in uh, Florida, and she was fucking hot, Phrase. I mean, gorgeous. And she wanted to stay for the second show. And this is, they call it the power of the putter. <laughs> yeah. She, I says, I don't want you to stay for the second show. I said, you know, you're going to see a lot of the same stuff. She goes, I don't care. I loved it. I go, and I'm thinking, I got a shot with this chick. If I, I don't want to wreck it. On yeah. the second show. Anyway, I did a completely different 45 minutes. I don't even know where it came wow. from. You know, like the, the fable about Jesus with the loaves and the fish? How it like, <laughs> yeah, accommodated yeah, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And there was only a couple, but they kept multiplying. That's what my act was like. <laughs> it was the power of her hotness, of me wanting Before to show to come up. up with material. Yeah, made me just like, you know, for that one moment in time, I was a higher level comedian. <laughs> Good thing there wasn't a third show. Oh my! <laughs> no, we did. There was a third show, but just between. Oh, her hey, and I, wait a come minute! Come on, all friend. right, folks. So this worked. <laughs> it did work. Bit of bing. Uh, Look, yeah, well, you know, it, it's uh, it's something that uh, we get used to, but I think the general public doesn't always know that. You know, and uh, that that you have to. It's the same show, and 
Um, yeah, I mean, you try and mix it up, but it's yeah. it's very hard to write. I mean, somebody said to me, does it get easier? And I said, I, actually, it gets harder in some ways because once you write better material, then you're you're competing with a better level, a higher level. Yeah. So now it's hard to crack the starting lineup. Well, that's true. And then the other thing is when you put something out, like um, I remember Dane telling me, he put out his first album, and... Um, then he, he, go, he went to do his second album, and he said, you know, I had to work 17 years yeah. to get the material for oh, yeah, that first yeah. album. Now I've got, you know, 17 weeks to come up with a second one. Yeah, I know. They don't get it. This guy, I, I did the uh, um, Tropicana in Atlantic City, which I fucking love. And uh, the guy said to me, we've got to get you back soon. Can you come back in like three months? I go, I can't write that fast. Yeah. So I don't care. Do this. I said I can't do the same thing. I got to mix it up a little bit. I, I, three months. He goes. When you can't come back? I said. You know, eight, ten months. Oh yeah. Uh, I mean, I love to get the money. I love to make that money, and I love the club. I love the casino. But, but uh, you're probably right in making that decision because yeah, you want it to be fresh for him the next time. Yeah. You know, and uh, I think that uh, the general public doesn't know how hard it is to write this stuff. I mean, oh, it's really, God, it's that's genius. the hard part, right? And, yeah, it, and, there, and that me. doesn't ever seem to get easier. No. Uh, you know, it's, it's um, and you know, I don't know how it is with you. I can't write for like months at a time, and then all of a sudden I'll write 50 things. Yeah, you know? exactly. Uh, exactly the same. And I got to give credit to those, you know, people always say to me, well, you should be on The Tonight Show writing. Uh, because you know you write those one-liners well yeah but those guys on the tonight show can write all day long every day yeah, i don't know how they, I don't know how they do it it's a different tool different i th couldn't stay in a cubicle that long. no it's a different part of your brain i couldn't either yeah and i've been guys, asked to write on sitcoms and punch I, I i don't have that kind of talent or patience patience i think is the yeah. key and those guys i don't know how they do it but uh my hat's off to them you God know bless your phrase hey Hey, cut it out. So, phrase, uh, do you want to do radio again? Is that what you... You, you know, Dom, I... Uh, I always thought you were so fucking good at radio. Oh, thanks, buddy. You always are nice to say that. I, you know, I loved it. I had a great time with it. I, I would take the right gig, I think yeah. is how I look at it. You know, uh, I'm talking a little bit now to the, uh, the serious people, maybe, about something. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, uh, we'll see. But I, I you know have done it for so long. I've, I did radio for 35 years. Wow. So wow. I'm really out of material. Yeah. And uh, after about 15 years, I think I was out of material. But I, uh, you know, I uh -huh. did have a great time with it. And, and uh, people ask if you miss it. Yes and no. I had to get up every day at 3.30 in the morning. I don't miss that. Yeah, that's, that's tough. I and think about that with Stern. He has a billion I'm dollars, amazed. but he's still getting up. I'm him. amazed at his stamina. I don't know how yeah. he does it. So, but, but. You know, uh, the other thing I don't miss is the bosses fighting with the bosses. Yeah. Because I did a lot of that, and I, and I think it's worse even now because it's a, a you know, a, a very corporate setting. But you know, uh, that was the those are the things that make you not want to do it. I think if you get the right gig, though, it would be good. And I'd rather move over into TV. I want to get a talk show. Yeah, you'd be great at that. That's what I want to uh, do. What about the sex capades with Charlene, Charlene Tilton? Well, uh, this interview, I think, is that? over, isn't it? Yeah. The, guy, the guy's giving us a rap cue. Did you ever uh, stop her? Uh, we, we probably shouldn't talk about that. You did then? Well, yeah. Phrase. Uh, <laughs> There's no one here, I guess we can say. The public demands to uh, know. Yeah. Well, you know. Uh, did, you, did you? How's her body now? It's, it's, it's okay. It's good. It's okay? Big hooters. Yeah. Big Hooters. Real. Yeah, and real. Yeah. She's, she's still hot. She's still hot. She's, you don't uh, bring her up here anymore. You're not friends anymore? We're still friends. She's still hot. She's, uh, <laughs> you know. Did you stop fucking her? Uh, well, we stopped going out. We stopped going out. And so you can't fuck her if you're not with her? No. And You could, uh, you could mail it to her. I could, that's always. You mail her an envelope of jizz. <laughs> Is that so about wrong? That. I hadn't thought about that, but. Is this thing on? Hello. <laughs> it could be another arrest for me. <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I uh, had the fortune or misfortune of dating a lot of celebrity women You're over very the years. shy for a guy who's a comedian who, about your personal life. Well, the reason is I've gotten in trouble for saying stuff in the past. Really? As you get older. Like what? You realize, well, 
it just you know it, not so much with women as as it is with uh, you know future or I mean former bosses. Oh, okay. I would say something, right. and then I'd think, well, no, he's gonna, he's not gonna, and then it would get back to him, and then I'd be screwed again. You know, like uh, what? Do you remember? Uh, I don't specifically remember, but I know that I there were occasions where I said something, and then later it would. Uh, I had made um, a comment about one guy. We used to do the uh, Rose Parade uh -huh. coverage every year, where you do a spoof of it. And I remember at one point, one of the floats got wedged between the grandstands, and our boss had been known to be putting on weight. So I, I said, there's so-and-so. <laughs> he stuck between the grandstands holding up the entire parade. So then one of our sales guys goes, that might have been the wrong thing to say. He's really sensitive about that. And sure enough, I was fired shortly. There. Were you really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's I mean, the great. guy kind of turned on me, you know, because yeah. I was calling him fat or whatever. And another thing Jamie did, uh, we had this guy <laughs> named Howard Bloom was our general manager at KMET, which is a famous old rock station uh -huh. in town. And uh, I remember Jamie couldn't say his name right, so he kept calling him Howard Balloon. <laughs> and Howard had also had a weight problem. <laughs> and he was always... Ballooning up? Yeah, ballooning up. <laughs> Howard Balloon, let me tell you. <laughs> I thought we were mocking him. Right. You know, it was just, no. Um, and then another time, I remember I... Uh, this wasn't on a show. Uh, uh, my boss, I used to, when I was late for work, which was a lot because I was still trying to stay out when I was younger and go to clubs and stuff. So then I, I'd be driving in late and the closest parking spot to the station was my boss's spot. So I'd park there, hoping to come out later and move my car. So he would get really pissed because a lot of times I'd forget or get busy and wouldn't move my car. So he, one day he had me towed. He kept threatening to. And uh, I go out there and, the, and I've got one of those, uh, I had a wireless mic and I go out and I go, uh, to the tow truck driver, I go, who's having me towed? Well, his name is uh, so-and-so, is my boss. So I go, that son of a bitch. <laughs> did so, he know it was your car? Yeah, Holy he had shit. me towed out of there. So what I did was, he, he had was just- having you towed because he was firing you? Well, no, he was just mad that I kept parking in his spot. Oh, okay. That's and I fun. did it kind of as a goof, but kind of also because yeah. it was close to the station. And anyway, um, so, uh, I then went on the air, and, I, and he had just gotten these personalized license plates that said, Too Hip, and that was my, slug, my slogan, Too Hip. And um, so he had those on his, on his uh, silver Cadillac. So I, I said, hey, if anyone sees a silver Cadillac with Too Hip license plates, flip him off. Do me a favor, <laughs> flip him off, will you? <laughs> right? So this guy, <laughs> everywhere he went, man, people were like, hey. yeah, he said, stopped at the light on the way to work <laughs> the entire city. Yo, pal. Eh. Because I was big then. I was like Howard Stern big, and everyone was listening to me, so they're all flipping him off, right? That's funny. Yeah. Um, well, I had a, a thing recently where I parked in Dane Cook's spot. But Dane and I are buddies, but he didn't, you know, I'm older than him. He kind of has a different kind of respect and all. Yeah. And he wouldn't confront me. He went to them and says, somebody's parked in my spot. He knows it's me. Right. Because Tosh, oh, yeah. Tosh had a problem with Dane having his own parking space. So funny egos. Right, right, right. You know? And uh, he, he didn't want to come around here because Dane had a spot. Wow. And he didn't. And, you know, I mean, finally he actually came around and then he stopped coming around with the uh, that whole. Uh, the rape thing? Yeah, the rape thing. Yeah. Well, you and Danny are good friends. Uh, and that thing was odd. I mean, it was another odd occurrence here. Yeah. Because. Well, Dan only because he was famous. Just well, like Michael yeah. Richards. Yeah, yeah. Michael, an open micer starts saying that stuff, and uh, it's not a big deal. Nobody cares. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, with, with, uh, with Danny, yeah, he's a brilliant comic. But he, he's obviously being ironic. He's not taking the side of rape. No. <laughs> you no. know? I mean, you've got to be really stupid to think yeah. that yeah. he really thinks he's... And I was here that night, and I was hosting that night, too. Maybe yeah. you shouldn't go on, guys, if I'm hosting, because I seem to <laughs> end a lot of careers. You started a lot of trouble in this place. <laughs> yeah. And uh, so, so that girl, the woman that complained was the only one who took the joke wrong in the audience. It was and a packed so, house. But he, but I was here. Yeah, you I know. was the reason he came along, because I hollered to you. I don't know if you remember this. Yeah, I hollered yeah. to you. Yo, Phrase, Tosh is here. Bring him up. Yeah, yeah. And you go, oh, okay. And the audience went crazy, and yeah. that, that happened. Because yeah. Daniel calls me up the next morning. He goes, Ask me how much I hate you. He says, how much do you hate me? He goes, listen to this. I hate you a lot. And then, then he tells me what happened. Wow. Yeah. I wow. said, you know, and I said, I'm sorry. God. He says, I'm not really mad at you. I shouldn't have said it. 
you know. Yeah, but you know what I mean. People, I think that uh, woman was looking for something. You oh know, yeah, well, trouble. people. I mean, forget it. They come to a comedy club. You can't, can't be thin-skinned. You no, know? and also you can't think that everything's for. I mean, no one's going to be for real taking the side of rape. You know, it's quite no, obvious. Like they're going to make a good point. But I'll tell you, the upside of rape <laughs> yeah. is it teaches you <laughs> how life can be. <laughs> you know, don't you have a bit where you say the positive side of uh, molestation? <laughs> well, I do. Well, actually, oh, yeah. I have a thing about date rape is saying that my cousin, I make it somebody else, so right. it doesn't make me sound ignorant. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm not condoning date rape. you got to admit it's better than the regular rape because you get like a dinner and a movie. You're yeah, right, right, right. Come right, on, right. I'm doing a little act. Yeah. Frey Smith, I, I love having you on here. Oh, My man, Dom. Frazier. I've been wanting to have you on for Thank a while. Thank you, buddy. Had a great Frazier time. Smith, everybody. Good night. Nice talking to you. Be well. Call yeah, I love me. your crowd. Yes. Thanks for coming out. <laughs>